So welcome to Asciato, a new talk series launched by MDPI. I am Professor Jon Mathieu, uh, Editor-in-Chief uh, of the MDPI Journal Histories. Uh, I am talking today with Professor Marcin Schröder, Editor-in-Chief of the MDPI Journal Philosophies. We explore his personality, biography, research field, and the journal. Uh, I will ask some questions about his personal path of knowledge, leading him to his position and his current work and insights. Thanks, Marcin, uh, for your participation in this experiment. I'm looking forward to your explanations. I'm always interested in how uh, philosoph philosophers uh, enrich our lives. May I first ask you to introduce you briefly by saying something about your current position, institute, and field of study. Thank you, Jan. Uh, I'm very happy that I have uh, this opportunity to uh, to have a talk with you, and uh, I'm also looking forward to uh, interesting exchange of ideas. And uh, I am a Professor Emeritus at Akita International University. I received this uh, title for establishing this university, <clears throat> but in 2019 I left uh, uh, AIU is short name for this. I left AIU for Tohoku University, but this year I had to retire. Uh, Tohoku University is national university, and I reached uh, the, uh, the end of career in national universities. You cannot continue past 70, and I am back uh, as a visiting professor at Akita International University. Uh, I, formally, I am professor of, of mathematics, but uh, my interests are, uh, of course, within mathematics, it is general algebra, but most of my work is related to information, especially uh, mathematical models and philosophy of uh, information, information integration, consciousness, and this kind of uh, methods. But of course, uh, my work is uh, saturated with mathematics. So I'm still, <laughs> in, even if I work on this or on uh, philosophy, I am always uh, at the back of my uh, uh, mind, I am a mathematician. Thank you very much. Maybe we start from the beginning. So I, I read that you are, were uh, born in Poland, in Wroclaw, maybe. You can tell us something about, you know, how did you grow your interest in your research field from, from childhood? Can you explain that? Uh, I remember, you know, like, uh, looking back in hindsight, very often you have some kind of uh, manipulated uh, image. So I cannot be sure if when I now what I think uh, directed me in my life, was exactly uh, true, but I remember when I was 10 years old, I got for my 10th birthday Encyclopedia of Natural Sciences. I was fascinated by this. One of this, I, uh, this I remember very well. I always was fascinated with a uh, view of stars. And, but I had this impression that there are millions of stars and that it is something which cannot be uh, known or understood or studied. And then reading this encyclopedia, I found that there are constellations, there are, that we can see only 3,000 stars. And the evening when I was reading it, I opened the window and I looked at stars and I started to see, oh, here is Orion, here Pleiades. And suddenly I could see that in this very rich reality, uh, there is lots of uh, uh, information, knowledge, but it is all this is knowable. And I think this was turning point uh, or directing point. Uh, I was, I was uh, really uh, fascinated by the fact that 
we can study things which at first look completely incomprehensible. So this is definitely which influenced me. But later, I, I, my uh, interests were very uh, much uh, changing and uh, diverse. So for instance, in high school, I wanted to be a painter. But I was always good, very good in mathematics. And I knew to be accepted to uh, art academy, I had to study drawing. And uh, this would be very hard work. So I went easy way. Mathematics was easy. So I, I uh, read a, a book by Heisenberg, Physics and Philosophy. And I was always interested in philosophy. So I went for physics. And this was uh, uh, like my university first degree was in theoretical physics. So uh, there were many things which were, but I think that what uh, I think was the biggest influence on me, uh, someone could say my father was a university professor, so it was natural to go into academia. But I think that this uh, encyclopedia of natural sciences, this was the point where <laughs> which influenced all my life. I started to see we can learn and uh, with this, it was contact between aesthetical things because I was influenced. I love to go to the nature. I love to go to the mountains. I love uh, this uh, uh, view of stars. And suddenly I could see you can know it. In some sense, you can own it. Where ownership is understanding it and knowing it. And I think that this was where I uh, was directed me to. Uh, uh, what I was doing the rest of my life. So astronomy took you took you in uh, first, and then you went to mathematics. If I uh, yeah, yeah but correctly, because, maybe you yeah. could talk something about uh, mathematics. Your your first career in yeah, the, actually my first career was theoretical physics, but when I was uh, there, I was uh, always. Uh, going very deep into mathematics and my superiors were saying, well, what you are doing is not physics. You, it's better for you to go to go to mathematics. So I moved from uh, after uh, four years, I moved uh, from Institute of Theoretical Physics to Institute of Mathematics. And then I went basically all the time i formally i was professor of mathematics and uh, how was your career path then uh, from uh, from this step on at the university in poland oh this was complicated you know like i uh, uh, when i was a young faculty it was time of big political changes the poland uh, was uh, before uh, 1989 was uh, under influence of Soviet Union, it was a communist country. Uh, I was uh, uh, always belonged to those who were not nice. And uh, in 1987, I got one way ticket to the United States. And, uh, and over there, I got my PhD in mathematics. Uh, so uh, I was in the United States. Uh, uh, for six years, and then I came to Japan. But formally, um, all my positions were I was a uh, professor of mathematics. Can you say something about your uh, uh, your experiences in the United States? You know, uh, what? Uh, how did you take up your your research questions and answer them? Uh, you did your PhD in the United States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, uh, I uh, uh, got my master's degree in theoretical physics in Poland. Then you continued. There was no graduate study, so you continued as a young faculty doing your PhD. But my thesis was uh, a PhD a dissertation, which I was preparing, was very mathematical. So I moved to Institute of Mathematics. I continued over there, but I uh, defended my degree already in the United States. And uh, like 
I cannot say that uh, my experiences were very much influenced me because at this time I already had quite crystallized view of what I want to do. Uh, you know, like I, uh, in my life, I had several like research projects and not all I had time to, uh, to develop or to, to um, implement. So I was working on something. There are some issues with now when I have more time, I can restart working on some, on some uh, projects from the very beginning of what I was doing. <clears throat> so, uh, because like my, uh, what I'm doing in my research, one of the things is sometimes I was asked, what you would be doing if you were very rich and you could decide whatever you want to do. And I would say exactly the same what I'm doing, except I would remove from this administrative uh, responsibilities. So uh, this way, I uh, where I was doing something was, of course, it influenced how much time I could devote to what I wanted to do. But basically, always I want I was doing what I wanted to do when I could do it. So was there any like, Sorry, this, was there any moment that you uh, hesitated in your research career that you thought maybe I quit and do something else in my life? No, no, because you know, as I said, I I was doing not uh, uh, these things. Of course, I I uh, several times I thought. Well, I had enough of this bureaucracy and so on. Sometimes I was moving from one university to to another when I had enough, but it was not change of career. It was change of where I was doing what I wanted to do. But I, I have to say, I was uh, very lucky in my life. I had chance to uh, build a new university, uh, AIU. I was in, uh, invited to work on Preparation of this university where I'm now visiting professor uh, before it was open. So, uh, and I was uh, uh, hired as Dean of Academic Affairs for this university. So I was involved in creation of curriculum of all this. So this was incredible experience and great satisfaction uh, when in uh, 2012, AIU became top university in Japan uh, from educational point of view. This is small university from the point of view of research. There's no way to compare with uh, Todai or Kyodai, means Tokyo University or Kyoto University. But this this was a uh, big satisfaction. And I I, uh, I was working with Dr. Nakajima, who was founding president. And I was lucky that he gave me lots of freedom in what I wanted to do. So this was like one uh, a lucky thing. I had this chance to uh, be uh, founding, um, founding uh, editor-in-chief in philosophies, which is also not every day you can have this kind of opportunity. So all this was uh, fantastic. You know, like when I looked, I, I was really, really lucky. Was it easy? Of course not. But life is not easy, <laughs> whatever you do. <laughs> It is not easy. So, so I consider that uh, there was some kind of providence which gave me uh, these big chances. And I'm very happy about this. And I'm grateful to, to my faith that I had this uh, opportunity. But that is very especially great, when, yeah. when I think about advising young people, don't think that anything is easy. I had lots of moments when I was really uh, 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 upset, and I was, uh, I, I couldn't see what to do. But I can say that all these cases where I uh, thought were really bad for me appeared, they were greatest opportunities. For instance, in the United States, I applied for a job where I was hired for one year, and uh, my uh, application disappeared. I knew what was, you know, it was my boss didn't have PhD. <laughs> I, I believe that there was some kind of, 
I was crushed because I wanted to get the green card uh, and uh, I thought that uh, uh, this is something like a big challenge. What I can do, I had that after uh, doing without uh, good job. But then I had opportunity to go for one year to Japan. I thought about the one year. And because I, I lost my job, I didn't know what to do. And then it turned out that this was the greatest thing which would happen. If this guy who stole my application, if I could thank him now, it was the best thing he could do for me. That's so great. many times I was very upset. I was, uh, I, I didn't know what to do. But these were times where actually I was pushed by destiny in the best possible direction. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like real life, <laughs> real <laughs> scholarly life. Um, yeah. When I listen to you, I think that uh, maybe your main driver in research is curiosity. Is that right? Yeah, uh, something like curiosity and uh, this uh, uh, value, which I think was... Uh, uh, like in, in Poland, when I was uh, a youngster, uh, there was very uh, high appreciation for knowledge. This was very, very high value. Unfortunately, it's gone. Now, everywhere, you know, like once the economy is going to be high, then people start to think more about money. You couldn't think about money because you couldn't at this time when I was in high school. Unless you you were really to uh, work with secret police, you, you couldn't earn almost big money. So the only other, other option was to go to uh, academia. But in general, there was this appreciation of knowledge, and I think it influenced. Uh, I I feel like that uh, like when, if someone is asking me uh, about my achievements, I know that. This is very difficult to say. Uh, like, if we measure achievement, maybe I didn't do much. Uh, but uh, of course, I, as I said, I had a chance to study the university, uh, journal, and so on. But okay, is it so important? Uh, but when I think what I con consider for myself uh, as achievement, is I learned a lot. And I had this incredible opportunity to learn. And this is something where people are not, I think, aware of, uh, of how lucky uh, they are if they have this opportunity to, to learn. Starting from this encyclopedia, yeah, I was, of course, like someone would say, this is not a big deal yeah, to give kids encyclopedia. But how many kids never have chance to get even one book, whatever will be the book. So, so there were many things which helped me. Uh, and, and of course, there was on my side, there was curiosity. But I think that one thing which very often is missing, I think there is importance of aesthetical side. I was really happy, as I said, for me, first sky was intimidating, but beautiful dark sky with stars and then i learned i can i can understand it i can i started to read and it is known why stars have different colors why uh, they are in this position or that position so this is something which uh, uh, gave me some kind of very subjective sense of well when i learn about it i fulfill my mission in my life the other mission is to help others to achieve something like this. So here is education. I was always very deeply involved in, in education. When but you come to... with a new question, you know, when you, you have a new question, new field, um, is aesthetics also very important? Do you have a method for... Uh, can you say something yes, about I, I, how, how you come up with a new... Very, very, very clearly. Uh, it is that uh, I can say this is a beautiful question, and this is Dao, and this is, of course, I know that uh, you have to, uh, people have to work 
on things which are uh, sometimes boring. But uh, uh, beautiful questions are for me questions which are leading to other questions. If there is a question and you can answer it, yes, no, or 55, 78, this is boring. But if there is a question and you start to try to answer and you can see, oh, this question leads to this question, this question, and it is growing, this is beautiful. So, uh, and of course, it is subjective. Very often, when you look at this, you may expect that, uh, uh, that oh, this is important. Then you see, no, this is not important. It's important what is behind it. So, uh, so here is, uh, I think that uh, this aesthetical part is very important. And actually, when I read uh, uh, like memories of uh, of many scientists, every, almost everybody is agreeing that there is something like beauty involved. Most famous are like Dira, not to say, if some theory is not beautiful, definitely be wrong. Yeah, so there is, but, but this is natural. This is this uh, meeting between conscious and unconscious or subconscious uh, part of our, of our uh, uh, life. Yeah, so I'm not. I'm not surprised. I, I'm quite sure that uh, this uh, matter of beauty is important. Do you have a special method to proceed a, a question when you have, you know, uh, you, when you see a new question, uh, uh, you know, a special method how you go on and. Yeah, I, I have, but it is very individual because of my background. I always uh, try to formulate it in mathematical terms. I'm looking for mathematical models. I look how uh, mathematical reasoning can help, and then I translate it back to the context. The context can be very far from mathematical theories. But uh, uh, definitely, look, for me, mathematics, it is tool for abstract thinking, and uh, usually, to avoid complexity, you have just the least level of the thinking. The big problem is very often people escape into abstraction, and this is not the way. You have to be able to go back and forth between our uh, time of, uh, of, of senses, of what we experience using our senses, and uh, the level of abstraction where we transcend what what our senses are telling us and where our mind allows us to get insight into what is happening at the lower level. Actually, when I say lower, there are many levels. Now, there's, there are levels, for instance, uh, there's level of human individual, there's level of uh, uh, or biological level of uh, organs, tissues, uh, uh, then going down molecules, then going down to to uh, elementary particles, and there is other level where it is involvement of human being. If there was only one human being, there would be no human being. Human being has to be part of some culture of some population uh, and sharing of culture, and then uh, these populations also share something. So there are many many levels and. Uh, successful uh, theories are those which allow going between these levels. Do you find usually any questions, uh, any answer to your questions, or um, uh, are they indeed answers to, to research questions? I think that answers to questions are questions. <laughs> Means <laughs> if uh, resolving some problem, you expose, okay, uh, there is answer, but it is based on some assumptions, and we have to ask about this assumption. This is success. I don't think um, any serious development in any kind of discipline where it would be final answer. There is no, there are no final answers, I believe. But answers which are leading to questions definitely are good.
So Marcin, uh, could you talk a bit about the relationship between uh, mathematics and philosophy? You, you, your PhD is in mathematics. Uh, can you say something how it relates to the philosophical tradition maybe and also to contemporary philosophies? No, this is for me a very interesting uh, topic uh, where maybe my position is a little bit extreme, but uh, where I can see the role of mathematics, at some point I said that for me mathematics it is a, a tool for abstract thinking. So uh, because of this, mathematics uh, has important role everywhere. And the same will apply to philosophy. And here I may be a little bit extreme, but where I can see possible contribution and where in my uh, publications I try to, to make this, uh, uh, to implement it, is that uh, mathematical models or mathematical modeling can clarify some questions where people uh, uh, continue discussion long time, they don't see that if you uh, read, if you clean the question out of something which is uh, not important, you, uh, uh, from a mathematical point of view, you can see that, for instance, there's no answer to this question or to this problem, or that there is only one, or there are many possible answers. So mathematical, uh, I, my dream is uh, uh, creating something like mathematical tools for philosophy. And it uh, has to be, it is completely different. Of course, there is philosophy of mathematics, but it's a different issue. Here is how mathematics can help uh, in philosophy. Uh, and uh, the main thing is, Philosophy requires some kind of level of, of abstraction. Again, someone could say, no, this, uh, philosophy should not go away from everyday experience. Of course, there are, there are different possibilities, but I believe that there is no uh, meaningful philosophy if you cannot go between different levels of, of abstraction. Starting from our sensory experience, going uh, uh, up, uh, looking for, for instance, some kind of universal process. The same will be, for instance, when we think about history. Now, I can see the role of mathematics in description of a possible different uh, historical uh, process. Uh, it doesn't, uh, I, I don't say, oh, this is the only way. So I, I can see it can be a tool which can help. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I, I uh, my, my dream and my uh, distant goal is to develop this kind of tools. And this is the reason why I'm uh, working uh, mainly uh, uh, about information and this kind of aspect, because this is like, on one hand, information in many different forms, like uh, processing of information, uh, integration of information, and so on. It is something which is universal right now. It's like, without computers, it's difficult to imagine modern life. So here is uh, uh, that information is a gate to all possible uh, applications. On the other hand, information can be analyzed in terms of, uh, of mathematics. It does mean that it is. Uh, Shannon's information theory is not in information theory, it's communication theory. But in general, information can be studied by, by, by mathematics. And this way we have this way from mathematics to study of information, to applications in philosophy, for instance, or basically in any kind of discipline.
But may, uh, may I just ask a question? Maybe a, a difference between mathematics and uh, philosophy would be the role of language, of natural language. You know that uh, if, uh, of course, I'm an amateur. You know, and for me, mathematics has something to do with formula and with figures, mm -hmm. and uh, philosophy has. Uh, uh, works with words, you know, with languages. Yeah. Uh, also, of course, logics. Maybe they meet in in this kind of logical venture. Or uh, is that right? What would you well, say? That? Some things, but you know, like mathematics. Uh, you know, again, it could be my background. I am uh, working in general algebra, so I would say mathematics is about structure. Formulas. Yes. Uh, like ways to study structures, but basically this is about uh, any kind of structures. Could be uh, number structures or topological structures, geometric structures, but it's about structure. So uh, this is why uh, I, I, I see it as a, a, a possible tool, because if we are uh, studying any domain, yeah, we are looking for explanation of, of functioning of some structures. Like in history, for instance, history in general could be uh, study how uh, social structures uh, uh, are, um, uh, uh, are shaped by historical process. Yeah, so the structure analysis is important. What I try to find, and I published several papers on this, this is uh, what I call the idol of numbers. Like, uh, I'm referring to Francis, uh, uh, Bacon's concept of his idols. Uh, that people are fascinated with numbers, and they believe if they know numbers, they know everything. They know nothing. Basically, even in physics, numbers are not important because numbers depend on uh, uh, superficial choice of units. It is structures, and of course, uh, numerical structures are uh, like a, a great tool for study in physics, chemistry, and so on, or many, many, many other disciplines. But on the other hand, we have to be aware that it is about structures, not numbers themselves. And here is false use of statistics. I'm teaching statistics, and it is always uh, and also consulted on, on, on statistical issues. People uh, believe that, okay, statistical uh, analysis gave this answer, but they don't understand that understanding what is the meaning of this uh, outcome is not as simple as people uh, expect. First, statistics is based on assumptions which uh, in, uh, in principle, cannot be satisfied. Now, statistics would work as uh, uh, where you can get sure results if you can have infinite sample. You cannot collect infinite sample of data. So, uh, typically, we say, okay, we'll say infinity, but it is enough to have 100 uh, elements in, in the sample. And of course, this is uh, influencing how to interpret. The result. And uh, the same as I, I said, uh, you cannot measure research by numbers. The same is you cannot measure anything. You, you can use numerical structures to understand what's happening in the research or in any domain. But the, there is never answer like to uh, scientific answer would be 3.5 or square root 2. No. Yeah, we have to look for structures. And here is basically where I can see the, the role that mathematics can help in analysis, uh, analysis of structures which appear in other disciplines, in philosophy, in uh, inquiries about basically any, uh, any subject. So you see structure, the notion of structure as some kind of unifying uh, concept? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, 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 basically, when I, like, my definition of, of information is based on the concept of structure. 
And here is where uh, people very often are losing this uh, uh, understanding of what are, for instance, results phys uh, in physics is not that we have particular numbers. It's only that we can say, okay, we can understand, for instance, what is happening uh, when we study uh, nucleus of an atom. But it is only about also about what kind of structures are involved. But it will be never in uh, answer five or seven or whatever. Okay. So here is mathematics. I believe mathematics is extremely important tool for philosophy, but it has to be used in proper way. Not like people believe, oh, you want to use numbers. No. Forget about numbers. Maybe not numbers, maybe geometry or maybe topology or something like that. And here I, 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 I see a lot of possibilities how this can be done. I try to do a little bit. It's not easy because it's uh, uh, very often reactions are, I don't understand. I don't like mathematics. I don't understand. Okay, how I can respond to this is somebody is saying, I don't, I don't like mathematics. It's difficult. And of course, I take responsibility that if I don't explain in my paper what are the sponsors, then of course, I cannot expect that uh, many people will understand it. So there's no way, no reason to publish uh, work which can be understood by five or ten people. Now I can send copies to everyone, and that's all. So it has to be presented in the way which could be understood by by uh, many people or particular audiences, conference audience, symposium uh, audience, journal audience, or something like this. I think also in the history of philosophy, uh, there were quite a few uh, philosophers that were between mathematics and philosophy. Yeah. Maybe Wittgenstein one, but not number two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, in case of Wittgenstein, he was uh, uh, like uh, apologist for common sense. And uh, here, uh, especially Wittgenstein too. So uh, here I can see some danger. I, you know, like, I love some of his uh, insight, which he gained through common sense. But sometimes it is very dangerous what, what he was uh, saying, especially when he is uh, like a little bit too much aggressive. For instance, uh, the, uh, his criticism of uh, the issue of identity. He was saying, if you say that uh, something is uh, identical with itself, it is trivial. If you say that something is identical with something else, it is nonsense. It is flattening the issue, <laughs> which I cannot accept. So there are many things, <laughs> but but of course uh, he had some kind of uh, interesting views on on the law. Of course, Wittgenstein one was more closer to mathematics. Yet he, uh, it was uh, Wittgenstein two <laughs> who cut <had> this relationship. <laughs> I, li I like the, the kind of numberation, you know, Wittgenstein, <laughs> one, two, three. <laughs> Would you accept this for your career? Marcin, yeah. one, two, three? Yeah, I think that this is something which everybody should consider. Because very often people are saying, oh, Kant was saying something, or Wittgenstein was saying, and then they forget that Kant was saying many things, and sometimes they were uh, 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 just uh, contradictory. People are changing, of course, I'm not changing. Uh, everyone is changing. So, my view, so oh, ma much more appropriate would be, say, Kant in um, critical pure reason or Wittgenstein in Tractatus, and then it is more 
there is uh, uh, nobody who, uh, at least nobody who could contribute something interesting, who never changed <laughs> their views. Yes. Yeah, I think most people change their way of, you know, uh, there is no unilinear uh, academic path. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mostly yeah. they are a bit, you know, multifarious. So. Yeah, this uh, is like <laughs> when you ask if I would agree uh, uh, about in one or two. Actually, this I was asked by like one uh, young guy why I don't write a book uh, summarizing my work on information, and I responded to him that uh, I, uh, it would be impossible because next day when I finish the book before sending it. I would burn it and I would start again writing because I'm I'm learning every day. I get new ideas. And very often when I when I read my old papers, I'm saying, well, wow, all this is bullshit. <laughs> it is not good. I would do it differently. So every day I am uh, my views are changing. So this this that way That sounds very Japanese. A, <laughs> Wouldn't it be a kind of a Buddhist monk saying the same thing, or in some sense, yeah, that, that, uh -huh. uh, there's uh, uh, you are never the same. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it is actually some kind of deep uh, idea in, in, in Buddhism that uh, we we make this big mistake by assuming that. Human being is something which uh, has permanent existence or long term existence, which is like a ripple on, on the water. Which... Did, did you take something uh, up in your kind of philosophy from Japan, from Japanese intellectuals? Yeah, definitely, but in, uh, uh, not the way that I would borrow from this, but for me, uh, my experience of life in Japan, in Japan, especially, I was very, I came to Japan because I was interested in Zen Buddhism. So I thought, oh, this will be a good uh, experience for one year. And after 30 years, I can see uh, much more. And I know that after one year, I wouldn't know anything about Japan. But it is after 30 years, the longer you are, the less you are. <laughs> Have this uh, sense that you understand Japan, but definitely for why for me Japanese experience and for instance Zen experience is so uh, important because I am a very rational person. It gives me some kind of alternative of uh, viewing reality, some kind of control. If you are very rational, you lose control over yourself because you eliminate these things which are subjective, these things which are coming from uh, experience which cannot be expressed in rational way. So uh, every time I go to Kyoto, I go, I have some favorite uh, Zen gardens. And I go there to have some kind of to report on what I was doing recently, uh, of course, in quotation marks, and to control myself. Oh, uh, didn't I forget about things which I cannot say in words? And this gives me uh, balance. And this is like where I can see very important balance between uh, the conscious and subconscious. Uh, this rational and uh, objective and subjective. And uh, this is where I see the importance of this uh, being involved in two words, in Western rational world and, for instance, Japanese, uh, especially Zen. When I say Japanese, of course, it is like two uh, well, what For me, most interesting is uh, is Zen, uh, let's say Zen philosophy. If there is anything like this, so uh, so this uh, this uh, I think is uh, crucial, and I would uh, recommend 
any philosopher to come to, to Japan and to spend some time to look uh, at these alternatives. When I say ever, especially Western philosophy. Does this uh, also show up in the journal? Uh, I, I encourage uh, this kind of uh, approach, but uh, so there are some publications which uh, which uh, I uh, induce by by saying, why don't you like? But the big uh, problem is uh, if you get involved with, for instance, Zen philosophy, you lose this. Uh, says oh I have to publish yeah this this is something where uh, you start to look what actually is important and important is to share but you don't have to share by publishing paper so some people when I try why don't you write uh, a paper they are saying no I, I, I don't see uh, if I write a paper, I will kill what I what I want to share with others. And or maybe very... you, maybe you could make an interview with a monk and publish it. Mm. So this would be uh, you know then the form would be there and uh, uh, yes, the wisdom would come, uh, flow into this uh, essay maybe. Yeah, the, the thing is that. Uh, Monks whom I know, Zen monks, would <laughs> wouldn't agree for uh, for interview. Or interview would be such that I wouldn't be able to write. It. Yeah, because if uh, I say something and somebody would put his shoe on 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 top of the head and leave the room, how I can write a paper about it? <laughs> so it is. It is not easy, but of course, it would be. Uh, this is important to engage people that they interact, and this can be helped. Yeah, you know, like with, with this, uh, like about writing, the most famous writer about Zen and popularizer of, uh, of Zen is uh, Suzuki Daisy. And it is interesting that the guy wrote a dozen of books about this. You cannot learn about Zen from books. So it is some kind of paradox. <laughs> yeah, learning this, you have to, uh, you can learn, I think, uh, a lot about uh, Zen philosophy, not by reading, by in rational way, but by immersing, in being immersed in a reality of this, this slow time, but regular time of uh, life of Buddhist monks. But you need, in this case, this subjective experience. And when you try to make it objective, it's very difficult, and maybe, maybe it is impossible. Maybe you could also take up, you know, this kind of paradox answering. You as a you know a, a non-answer being an answer which yeah, seems yeah. to be rather typical uh, yeah. and uh, maybe this is uh, also quite exceptional because answering is an important uh, uh, way of of doing research in the west as well but yeah. giving no answer is also an answer maybe that could be a, a philosophical uh, topic yeah, it is because basically, when we look at science in general, science is never ending, so there is no final answer. So, in some sense, what you say, like if uh, I could, I could imagine that somebody, if I ask him or her about uh, the issue of, or is there any answer? This person wouldn't say anything and would start to do something, for instance, an experiment or something like this. Now, if this would be answer, okay, answer is to learn, to 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 try to find uh, understanding. But you cannot say there is final answer to this because there's no final understanding. 
Yeah. So this this are uh, and and I think that uh, of course this is going quite deep, but I think that it it is a uh, very valuable experience uh, to come to Japan even for a short time, but it has to be uh, facilitated by someone who uh, wouldn't heal this experience by going to tourist spots and looking at this uh, uh, flashy uh, superficial uh, surface. Well, it, it takes years to really understand and even if, when I say really, I exaggerate to understand a little bit of uh, this Japanese tradition. And what is funny, not many Japanese people uh, have understand rational understanding of this. When I talk to my Japanese friends, very often they are saying uh, uh, that uh, I, I'm not Buddhist, I'm not uh, Shinto, I, I don't care. But then, uh, uh, in their behavior, you can see that they are very strongly attracted to this tradition. And uh, if you ask, well, so what are you doing uh, on New Year's? Uh, well, of course, I'm going to, to, to the temple and there are these uh, 108 gongs and all that stuff. And of course, I don't say you said that you don't care about this, but it is something that uh, society is. There is a lot of uh, 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 foundation in the tradition. Even people, my my some of my friends, they don't have an idea what is the difference between uh, sects of of, of, of Buddhism. They don't understand that, uh, for instance, what is the uh, difference between Rinzai, Zen, and Soto. Zen. For them, it, they even don't know that it exists. Not only do they don't uh, understand the difference. But in some sense, this influence of uh, Zen tradition is visible everywhere. If you go to a restaurant, if you go on, on a subway, Everywhere there is some kind of uh, residue of of the culture, even if people don't don't know much about. It. But this is basically how it is with every culture. I would say the same is in with Polish culture. Someone could say there is no nothing like Polish culture because Poland right now is like uh, westernized, and but of course there are some cultural traditions which are uh, behind. Very simple things: how people think, how people, uh, what people uh, love, what they hate. So this residue of uh, cultural tradition and uh, philosophy, which is behind it, is is uh, present probably in every community. It could be on the national scale, it could be local scale, it could be, for instance, in academia. Different different uh, research institutions may uh, have different cultural traditions where philosophical issues are uh, underneath. Even if people uh, will say, "I don't know anything about philosophy," but of course everybody has some philosophy. Maybe not very impressive, but how how you go through your life if you don't have any philosophy? And so it, it is something impossible to avoid, but of course, uh, the, the other side of philosophy can help when you have troubles, when you uh, want to know what to do, when you look even for research projects, then this philosophy can be helpful. So it's also a medicine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can uh, now come a bit to to publishing, you know, to open access publishing. Uh, could you say something about the impact of this way of publishing uh, your experience with the journal? You know, I, uh, I have a lot of objections to what is happening in at this social level of uh, of science. So. Uh, 
open access is definitely very important. Uh, but it is a little bit like uh, like some of people are using this metaphor of too short comfort. You pull it one direction, then your feet uh, are sticking out. You cover your your, your feet, then your arms are uh, shivering. So this this is uh, the issue. The, but the, I can see the problem is that uh, uh, right now. Uh, those who are responsible means uh, ad uh, administrations at high level, especially governments, they are pushing away this issue of how uh, science can uh, uh, or academia can work. So here is that governments are res irresponsible. And then it is uh, uh, what is negative is that people very often are attacking or open access or if it is open access, it is bad. It is uh, uh, predatory uh, publishing and so on, which is stupid because uh, 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 publishers who are publishing not in open access uh, are making huge money and nobody complains. But if or uh, it is written that you have to get funds to be, you know we, we are living in some kind of economical uh, reality nothing is for free somebody has to do money so open access is uh, is for me the way how it should be the problem which is not the result at least for instance mdpi is trying to solve it to look for the ways how uh, the authors could get money for, for publishing. But you know, like we have to be realistic. Someone has to put money. Governments do, do not want to do it. So it has to be organized somewhere. But uh, but I'm not uh, I'm sure it is uh, right now we cannot say all the results. There are MPPI is trying to organize some kind of uh, resources for for uh, the office. But but Without involvement of uh, of uh, governments of uh, all society, this is not the final solution. And there is the other thing is which I can see. Uh, this is not related to open access, but in general, there is a, a big noise about that industry is paying for research, and then seven like in medical research. 75% of publications publish results which are uh, uh, later uh, are shown that they were uh, uh, false. Of course, if uh, industry is uh, demoralizing science by paying only for positive results and not for negative results, what they expect? They will have 75%. They should be lucky with 75%. Not 90% of, of uh, results which are uh, which are false. So here is there's a lot of things which should be done, but I see open access as uh, uh, for my me uh, like personally for my own research. This is London. I, I read a lot. I wouldn't be able to to get this uh, money for for so, uh, access to to uh, all this. So this is the direction to go, but it has to be lots of additional work. How money should be, uh, how resources should be allocated for people who are from poor countries, for uh, universities. You know, like uh, when I read that to publish, I think in one of the top. Uh, journals, uh, 8,500 uh, euros to publish uh, an article about microbiology. Your uh, average research money for one year at my current university is $3,000. This means you have to have money for several years to publish one article. So this is great. Yeah. So from this point of view, uh, I, I appreciate what MPPI is doing, but this is just first step. Lots has to be done 
to organize this. And people have to be aware, nothing is for free. You are the editor-in-chief and the founding editor-in-chief of the journal uh, Philosophies. Uh, may I ask you, what do you like about the journal and how it developed? So uh, I had this incredible opportunity to start it. So I uh, I wrote this um, introductory article about how I envision it, and uh, I directed philosophy into uh, in, in in the direction of integration of philosophy with science, technology, uh, cultural studies, and so on. So what I uh, could see as a, a most important mission of, of philosophy, the philosophies, is to find uh, this, uh, uh, to reintegrate what was lost in specialization. Where specialization in science started from zero, it was like uh, right now, 200 years ago, there was this, this realization that uh, something is wrong, that people who are working in quite close disciplines cannot understand each other. What is the knowledge that nobody can understand? It? So this is where I can see the role of philosophy. And I wrote about this. Of course, uh, it helps that I, when there are cases where people are complaining that uh, their paper was rejected, sometimes I have to reject papers definitely does not fit uh, the journal, even if the paper uh, was not going to peer review. Because it's clear that if uh, someone is saying, okay, my paper is about philosophy, how to sell potatoes, and um, my company has very different philosophy of, uh, of this issue, say, so, well, it's not exactly how we understand philosophy. And if you can show that philosophy in marketing potatoes is important for other disciplines. Yes, we can think. But if you just compare philosophy of selling potatoes between you and a company, no, sorry, look for journal where people are interested in this competition. So, uh, but I think that important is we have some kind of clear mission. Of course, somebody else could do something else, different direction. But this helps in selection of what is uh, published, or at least what is going to be peer reviewed. I'm not sure if I answer your question. Oh, yes, yeah, you do. Uh, what makes you continue uh, this collaboration with MDPI? Can you explain that? Again, this is something which I, uh, uh, this um, uh, mission of integration of knowledge directed me in what I was doing for years. This was the same when I was working on preparation of this uh, university, African International University. It was the same. Uh, I, I was pushing towards uh, liberal art, but specifically understood, very often misunderstood as a way to integrate uh, different forms of, of, of knowledge. So all the time I was uh, committed to this kind of task. Uh, I'm very happy that I can contribute to the continuation of, uh, of philosophies. And I'm happy that thus far it goes very well, how, uh, how it develops or, or evolves and so on. So, um, uh, it is just doing what I would like to do, wherever I would do. <laughs> Philosophy is one place where I can, uh, I can try to achieve uh, like what I see important. Yeah, great. Yeah, I, I have also this idea. You know, uh, I'm also editor in chief of another journal, so uh, uh, I I like the infrastructure. The digital infrastructure is solid. I find with MDPI. What do you say about the infrastructure? collaboration with the offices and uh, collaboration with offices is, is very good so i'm happy about this the only thing which uh, i uh, i will improve is uh, especially for philosophers it is important that we have a little bit different audience different people who uh, are uh, submitting papers because uh, 
for instance, questions when there are uh, when there is this uh, uh, website and uh, where the authors are, uh, the reviewers are writing the, the, their evaluation, I would uh, prefer to have it a little bit more specific to the mission of the job. It would make everything more complicated. So I understand that this is not easy. And there were some changes made which, which uh, I'm satisfied. But I think that uh, one of these things which uh, I know it's not easy, but I would uh, I, I would say it would improve. Uh, maybe not all, but at least some journals uh, published by MDPI is to more a little bit more individualized style of work. Definitely, there are journals which are uh, which have different mode of operation. And in this case, to uh, individualize journals could help. It's not a big problem. Most of the reviewers are uh, understand well what are these questions they have to ask, but uh, could be a little bit better. So I see, and I'm trying. We are discussing sometimes with the editorial office about what to do, and hopefully at some point. Questions will be more uh, like my, I can tell you what 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 kind of problem I can see. Uh, the, uh, these questions are about uh, I don't remember exact formulation, but uh, whether paper is um, uh, referring to uh, existing usage of the site, and I want to change it. It's not referring, but engaging. With this background, because I can see that right now a lot of submissions are somebody's introduction. Like my paper is uh, contributing to the uh, study, which uh, was in this paper. This paper, twenty uh, references to twenty papers, and then nothing. So, if uh, if I complain, the background is not explained. Was, oh, I was writing about it. You can find this in this publication. But it's not engaging with this. So this is completely useless. But you, this, of course, somebody may find uh, new references he or she didn't know. But it's not uh, what, if in introduction, you have to say how your uh, methodology or your results are uh, related to work before, not where you can find which publications you can find some of this. It has to be discussion. Not that you mention all oh, this and this and this person already uh, discussed. So on. it doesn't answer uh, the question. So here are things which I think could be improved, and hopefully at some point will be improved. So we have still a lot to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you but very much good. for this great talk. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I was enjoying it. Uh, it's very interesting. Yes. How you are dealing with this kind of issues? You get paper submission, and how you decide? Because history is, it is again very broad uh, topic. How you decide? Okay, this submission is not fitting my joint. Yeah, I think the main criterion is professionality. Of course, this is always also a bit. Uh, uh, subjective but it's also experience you know you see there's a the kind of professional ethos in, in in this in history and i think this was uh, the main point in in launching the the journal because of of course all my colleagues were horrified and said oh are you doing trash now Jan? <laughs> <laughs> We we can decide what is trash and not. So, <laughs> no, I agree with you with this uh, issue of professional. But this is something where immediately when I read abstract, I can see it is professionally written or not. The problem is I cannot say well your paper is professional. So, uh, and uh, at some in some sense I I, I am. Uh, concerned about historical issues, like for instance, in mathematics, 
there are uh, no cases where uh, some works, like Evaris Galois, who wrote uh, his memoir about impossibility to solve some types of equations. His work, he, he was killed very uh, young, but uh, his memoir was ignored because it was written in, in a non professional way, using uh, wrong, like not, not uh, use symbolics and it was not clearly written. But then, 25 years later, it was recognized that this was uh, like uh, this guy was a genius. So I always try to avoid the situation, okay, that uh, I wouldn't like to uh, or, or reject paper uh, which was written by a genius who didn't have chance to acquire this professional skill. Uh, this, I think, in his stories is a little bit easier because, uh, like in philosophies, there are many different approaches. Uh, we, we talked before informally uh, about, uh, for instance, uh, issues related to postmodernism, and very often I uh, I can object uh, some some uh, methodologies, but if this is something which uh, is bringing some kind of new view, uh, I will say, okay, this formally is uh, correct. So I agree. But it is really, I, I, I know, I, I agree with you that all this is based on experience. Uh, so you have experience, you can recognize easily, or oh, this is something which is not professional, but then of course I always try to check, and it is painful because it takes lots of time to read something which is written in an incoherent way. Is there something really behind it? Unfortunately, very often I have to say, well, no. I can see claims made in this paper are absent, but it, it is some kind of. Uh, Difficult decision. Yes, yeah, the, the, the decisions are, are difficult. Sometimes I also, uh, you know, um, I'm sad about having to reject something uh, with history and general history. And the, the new thing about this open access is that this is global from right from the beginning. So we have another discussion about, you know, market economy and so, and it wouldn't be appreciated there. And if we take it in, people think, what is this journal? You know, it's it's a bit no. funny. It's not really scholarly. So we have always to to balance these two sides. As you said, also, uh, you know, to, to develop a bit a, a kind of global scholarship would be, I think. Yeah, I think that you, you are addressing here a very, very important uh, thing. Is, and I agree with this, that the law of uh, all journals is not just a gate to publishing, but it is advising people. For instance, peer review, I always want to uh, to uh, make it not a gate, but some kind of way to interact with uh, the authors, to advise them. Maybe paper finally will be not published, but each peer review makes sense, if it is serious peer review, to help people to improve the, their text. Maybe later they can send it to some other journal. But here is, uh, I think that uh, this is one of most important roles, is uh, that journals should influence what uh, the situation. This is why, for instance, even if uh, use of special issues is criticized, and there uh, are restrictions on this. It is the way how journals can stimulate interest in uh, issues, can guide young researchers uh, what topics are of special importance for all communities. Of course, every individual can have choice of whatever they want to study. But journal can, by using special issues, can direct young people 
what they feel is topic, typically there is a summary, and you can see what kind of issues others are waiting for solutions to problems, what kind of topics are of special importance. And this way, I think uh, journals are fulfilling this mission of its role in academic society or in society in general. So here is, uh, I, I really uh, don't like this approach that uh, this is one of these diseases of science. Uh, it is this uh, publish or perish and number of index uh, like bibliometrics. Of course, it is important, but sometimes someone can write one paper and it could be something which is really extremely influential. And somebody else recently uh, uh, probably heard about the guy who uh, publishing 500 papers uh, a year using uh, chat GPT. And, uh, uh, and of course this guy with 500 uh, papers is famous where someone whose paper could write one or five papers only, but which are really important. And uh, the problem the here is it's not fair to measure uh, outcomes of research by simple numbers. Yes. Yes, yeah, so I agree. Can... I agree. Yes. Uh, I have also yeah. this experience. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the journals are more, it is more than just uh, published. Yeah. It's not just website where you put uh, outcomes, but it is the process and it is it has the role which is important for for everyone. Yeah. And here also I about that... creating a kind of community between yeah. scholars and uh, yeah. Um, yeah. between curious people everywhere. Yeah. yeah, 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 and helping young people in making decisions in understanding. Uh, the, the bad thing is that, uh, maybe I am a little bit extreme, but I don't like this kind of approach like uh, Nobel Prize. Um, academia is not sports, it's not who is like winning. Uh, very often, like uh, there are Nobel Prize awards like in physics, which I'm familiar with many disciplines of physics quite well. I've never heard about uh, these guys. And when I read what they did, it's like, well, they improved some part of, 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 of some apparatus to do this, but they didn't explain anything. So here is what is unhealthy is measuring things simply by numbers, uh, looking at success through Nobel Prize or any kind of big prizes which sometimes, of course, are justified. Sometimes I'm, I'm puzzled why they gave Nobel Prize for something like this. And, but people are saying, oh, if some guy uh, got Nobel Prize and now he's talking about completely different discipline, it must be true. This is this hollow uh, or hello uh, effort. Now this uh, this uh, thing, uh, research cannot be uh, 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 measured by simple numbers. So we will go to Norwegia to complain about yeah. the price. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank you very much, Martin. I, feel like I would I would say they they should understand and they should propagate. They would say say like uh, actually uh, Swedish in this committee. They could say we are selecting some people because of their influence, but it doesn't mean that uh, this is like only important thing. There are many important things in the world which uh, and many people contributed a lot and they, they were never recognized. At least they selected Bob Dylan you yeah, know, yeah. from the literary prize, but he didn't go there. <laughs> <laughs> he was so astonished. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was so yes, uh, uh, very interesting what you said about Poland, you know, in your youth, about yes. this importance of knowledge. Yeah, I think that yeah, uh, 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 well, I, very unfortunately, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, now young people have lots of opportunities. And because of this, academia is <laughs> losing. It's well, because, <laughs> because it is like everywhere in the world, uh, career, university career is not uh, like career where you can have money or you will be uh, adorned by uh, crowds. Very often you work all your life, you do excellent job, but it is like recognized only by a few who can understand it. Yeah. Now it's 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 very late in Japan, I guess. It's about ten o'clock in the evening or eleven. No, 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 it is just six o'clock. Oh, is it? Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, I thought it's on the other side of the world. Uh huh. No, it, it is. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's very easy to be confused which way you go ahead or but back. You are an astronomer, not me. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you very much. That was very interesting. I'm very impressed. Also uh, uh, fascinated, of course, by this Japanese contribution. Um, yeah, thank I think... you very much. It was very nice uh -huh. talking to you. And uh, I hope we will have the opportunity in the future to talk more. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And good luck for the journal and for your you. retirement or non-retirement. <laughs> and uh, wish me good luck for non-retirement. <laughs> yes. <laughs>